have your Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're in a sermon series walking through the book of Ecclesiastes, and we titled it, How to Ruin Your Life. And here's how we got the title. Uh, the writer of this is Solomon, who's David's son. He's the third king in Israel, and he's looking back as an old man, looking back on his life, and he's looking back with a lot of regret. And he knows that he made a lot of mistakes and he sought happiness and joy and purpose and meaning in all the wrong things. And so he's writing this to teach us not to make the same mistakes. In fact, look at there at the top of your notes in Ecclesiastes 7.5. He says this, it's better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. And so today, specifically, what he's going to talk about is if you want to ruin your life, pick the wrong people to hang around with. Uh, pick the wrong friends and, and, deter, and get in the wrong kind of relationships, and that will ruin your life. And he's going to give us some warnings today. He's going to talk about four different kinds of people to avoid and then the benefits of really having healthy relationships in your life. Now, let me ask you. How do you choose your friends? I mean, we all have friends and acquaintances, but who do you choose to be your friends? And by that, what I mean is, who are the people in your life that you've been invited to speak truth into your life? Those who, when they talk, you listen. Those that, whenever there's issues, they're the ones that you call. When you're going through a storm, you know that they're going to be with you. Who are those friends in your life? You know, everybody should be able to pop up about six or eight or ten names that you say, this, man, these are the ones who are there through thick and through thin. And, and, and this becomes much more important in our lives today as we become so mobile in our society. Every time you move, you, you are introduced to a whole new group of people. And how do you determine who those inner city, I mean, inner circle people are going to be, who are going to be your deepest friends? And it doesn't mean you give up your old friends, you know, that, that I mean, there are friends that I've had for 20, 40, you know, 45, 50 years, but there, there needs to be friends in proximity to where you are now, and how do you determine that? This becomes incredibly important when you go to college. And now you've got to determine a whole new set of friends. And, and by the way, the friends that you pick when you go to college will have a lot to do with your success or failure. When you get married, how do you determine your couple's friends now, right? And, and who's going to be the ones? Because she brings friends and you bring friends. And some of them are single and some of them are not. And she doesn't like these. And who do you pick, you know, as your friends when you do that? When you, maybe when you change jobs or change a church, you're thrust into a group of people you don't know that well, so how do you choose? Well, Solomon's going to give us a lot of wisdom today about who to and who not to choose. Solomon's written a lot about this. If you go to Proverbs, there are a ton of Proverbs where Solomon warns about the friends that you pick. And I, I'm just going to read two of them. Proverbs 13.20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Proverbs 14, 7, leave the presence of a fool or you will discern or you will not discern words of knowledge. Paul wrote to the church of Corinth and he said this, he said, bad company corrupts good character. And who we choose as a friend matters. And Solomon is going to warn us about four types of people to avoid. They can be acquaintances, but they really shouldn't be your go-to inner circle group of friends. So as we look at, the, at, at what Solomon has written today, I want you to look at it through two lenses. Number one, which I think is the purpose for him writing this, is how do I choose my friends? I need to discern my friendships well, and I need to avoid certain things. That's one lens. But the other lens is Am I one of these people, <laughs> right? I need to self-examine my life to make sure that what Solomon is warning against, I'm not one of those. And let me just say, we're all some of those in, to some degree. 
And you're going to see it as we look at this, as Solomon gives us some wisdom on who to choose and who to avoid. In your notes, the first thing he's going to say, man, if you want to ruin your life, a foolish person does this. He picks, first of all, a friend who is envious. Who is envious. Look at what he says in Ecclesiastes 4.4. 4. And I saw that all labor and all achievement springs from man's envy of his neighbor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Now we're about a month ahead when we preach messages. We've gone over it, introduced it about a month ago. So we've had time to really deal with it. And this verse here has just destroyed me the last month. Uh, because the first time I read it, I thought, okay, Solomon, that's a little hyperbole. You're kind of going overboard to make a point, right? All labor and all achievement springs from man's envy. And you're just kind of shock value. But let me just say this. He's on to something here. And there's some of this in all of us. That all of us have some of this in us. And think about why Solomon is writing this. Solomon is the richest man in the world, the most powerful man in the world. He's got 700 wives and 300 mistresses on top of that. And everybody was looking at Solomon and saying, man, I wish I could be like him. I wish I had his money. I wish I lived in that, in that house. I wish I could do all of these things. And so Solomon understood in his day the envy of people. But let me just say this. It's as relevant and maybe more relevant today than it was then. In fact, today, sociologists have given it a name, and it's called conspicuous consumption. And what it teaches is this, that the clothes you wear, the car you drive, the zip code of your house, many times are driven not because you need them, but because you want to be seen in them. And what Solomon is saying is at the center of our hearts, we do what we do because we want to be noticed. We envy others. We want ourselves and not them to be the best, to have the best, and be noticed more. Here's how I know it's true. We will spend 4 to $6 for a green and white cup. Some of y'all are getting it, okay? We'll spend four to six and some more than that for a green and white cup. So blind taste test shows that if you don't know what you're drinking, most people prefer another brand than Starbucks. So if you really prefer another brand, then why do you go to Starbucks? And look, I'm not a hater. Uh, I'll be there tomorrow, I just won't make eye contact, okay? <laughs> so why would you spend six bucks on a cup of coffee? Here's why, when you hold the cup, here's what it says. I get it. Uh, yeah, I know, I'm cool, I got it, right? You're drinking Dunkin' Donuts, so sorry for you. <laughs> you know, I got my Starbucks. And it really is all about conspicuous consumption. We want to present an image of ourselves. And this has gotten hundreds and thousands worse because of social media. You go on social media, and here's what we see, man. You go on social media, and people are posting all the great places that they're eating every night. They don't, you know, and so you, you're at home with the mac and cheese leftovers and you open up Facebook and somebody's out at the best, newest steakhouse, envious. They're posting of all the parties and places where, where they go. They're posting that their kids are being inducted into the National Honor Society and you're just praying for C's, right? <laughs> And it produces envy and covetousness and jealousness in our lives. I'm going to just confess some sins this morning. Do you ever look up old friends just to see if they did worse than you did? <laughs> I mean, come on. Let's just be honest. Open up an old, old pal to play football with. Yeah, it looks like he's an alcoholic and he's divorced. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm doing better than he is, right? Now, we don't ever do that. We wouldn't say that. 
But there's a part of us that is envious that we're kind of, we want to know that we've achieved, that we've done more than somebody else. We want to feel good about ourselves. And here's my sin. Look, I, and I know it. I don't care where you eat. That doesn't bother me a bit. Right, I, I don't care if uh, you're, you know, you got a new car, post it all you want. It, look, if your kids got a National Honor Society, that's great for a third grader. Wait till they grow up, let's see what happens, right? <laughs> all of those kind of things, I'm fine. Where it kills me is traveling, all right? So, so I just love to travel. I love to go everywhere. And so when I flip it open, and we've got this one young lady in our church. She works for Expedia. And her full-time job is to travel to exotic locations, all right? So she's rating a five-star hotel in Bangkok. And it's like, oh, man. And just, just, again, this has been beating me up. This week, one of our deacons, I go online. He's eating dinner in Amsterdam. My first thought was not, well, good for him. Amen. <laughs> My first thought was, Doggone it, I've never been to Amsterdam. Why does he get to go to Amsterdam and I hadn't been to Amsterdam? And you know what? I wouldn't have had that. I wouldn't have been in if it wasn't for social media. So it just ramps it up, right? Why do they do that? We don't do this. And, and this whole comparison model, and here's what Solomon says. You want to ruin your life? Be envious or befriend yourself with envious people. Because your best interest is never really at heart because it's all about them. Second thing he says, avoid lazy people. To avoid lazy people. <laughs> Look at what he says in Ecclesiastes 4, 5. The fool folds his hands and ruins himself. And here Solomon is warning about people who are lazy and have no ambition, no dreams of achievement. And I'm sure that Solomon dealt with this in, in so many ways as people were looking at Solomon for a handout and, and just people expecting to live off of Solomon. See, these people want to be taken care of and won't take responsibility for their own lives. They feel entitled or victimized and they expect others to take care of them. And Solomon's saying, don't make these people your inner circle. In fact, today we even have names for it. We call it codependency and enabling. Proverbs 6, Solomon writes an entire Proverbs on this where he says, go to the ant, you slugger, and see how he works. And he goes on to say this, how long will you lie there, you slugger? Will you get up, when will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. The Bible is full of warnings about us being lazy. And what we need to understand is that God created work and work is good and we find significance in work. A couple weeks ago, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation is why we're sitting here today. And some of the things that came out of that are sola scriptoli. We're gonna, it's, it's, you know, scripture that's gonna guide our lives. The priesthood of the believers, everybody has access to God. You don't have to go through anybody else. God dwells in you. But one of the great tenets of the Protestant Reformation is the Protestant work ethic. And it's a shame it got to that, but they had to remind us that God created work and we find significance in work. In fact, God created the garden. He created Adam and Eve. What's the very next thing? He said to Adam and Eve, get to work and tend the garden. It's harder today because of the fall, but we're still to, to, uh, to work. And so, um, so what we need to understand is Solomon is saying, man, if you want to ruin your life or if you want to, ru if you, uh, want to ruin your life, it's one of two things, either befriend a lazy person or be lazy yourself. And so that's secondly. Third, Solomon's going to say an insecure person. To befriend yourself with somebody who's insecure. Notice what he says in verse 6. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil, a chasing after the wind. 
What he's talking about here is that they're working to try to find significance. They're insecure, so if they give themselves to their work, they can get a little bit more money in the bank, and the money is bringing them significance. Or if they work really hard, they'll build a name for themselves, and their reputation will bring them uh, security and significance. And Solomon is saying, boy, watch out for that. Paul, speaking to Timothy, said it this way, but godliness with contentment is great gain. To be content in, in what, who God has created you to be and what he's designed you to do. Insecure people aren't, aren't doing that. We need to, to find our identity in Christ and to ask for his wisdom to create balance in our lives. Solomon's saying, be content. Man, trusting in your toil, your work, your job is a chasing after the wind, and it will destroy you. And then lastly, Solomon is saying to avoid those who are alone. And, and let me qualify here that there are many reasons why you may feel alone. Solomon is talking about one specific reason here, and so he's not giving commentary on all the rest. He's just talking about one reason here. Let's pick it up. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all what? All alone. He had neither son nor brother, so he has no family. There was no end to his toil, so he's a workaholic, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. So here's what he's saying. There, there was a man, he didn't have family, but he's a workaholic, and he's, doing, he's, he's spending all of his time working. There's no end to his toil, and it's never enough. And then this man has an aha moment. Look what it says next. It says, for whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? It's as if one day he woke up and he said, he had one of those uh, aha moments like we see the prodigal son. It says, when he came to his senses. Well, this man came to his senses and said, what good is it to have a big house if I'm never there? Because I'm always at work trying to pay for the big house. Uh, what, what good is it to have a lot of money in the bank when I don't have anybody to pass that money on to? And he's talking about a man who was alone because his highest priority wasn't relationships. His highest priority was get as much as he could get. Some of you might have heard of Marcus Person. His online name is Notch. Uh, Marcus created the video game Minecraft. In 2000, yeah, the, the young people, yeah. Well, listen to this. I get an amen from the, from the students today. <laughs> 2014, he sold Minecraft to Microsoft for $2.5 billion. Even though he was Swedish, he bought a mansion in Beverly Hills, eight bedrooms, 15 baths, 70 million cash. Today, he's worth $1.5 billion dollars, and he, in everybody's idea, is living the American dream. Still a young man, wealthy beyond understanding, has a great reputation, and here's what he did. He wrote a series of tweets, and let me just read some of his tweets. Problem with getting everything is you run out of reasons to keep trying and human interaction becomes impossible due to imbalance. Hanging out with a bunch of famous people, able to do anything I want, and yet I've never felt more isolated. When we sold the company, my biggest concern was to make sure that the employees were all taken care of and now they all hate me. Found a great girl but she was afraid of me and my lifestyle. And so she left me and went to be with a normal person instead. $1.5 billion net worth and Notch is all alone. That's what Solomon is warning against here. You know, I have a propensity and my father recognized this in me to be a workaholic. This morning I actually said at the 
808 service, I actually said, I have a propensity to be an alcoholic, and then I had to change that. <laughs> but uh, I have a propensity to be a workaholic. And my father saw that, and yeah, when I was 12 years old, there was a convenience store that would hire me for a dollar an hour to stock the shelves and, and, uh, and all of that. And, and so I've always worked and worked hard. And, and, um, and so my father told me this. Last week I talked about my wisdom to Seth was, you know, that today is the first day of the rest of your life. Decisions you make today determine who you're going to be tomorrow, who you're going to be eternally. My father's advice like that to me was always, Chuck, it's no good to earn a living if you're not going to live. He probably told me that 500 times. It's no good to earn a living if you're not going to live. That's what Solomon is telling us here. This man wakes up and realizes how meaningless it is to earn a living when you have no one to share it with. Like I said, Solomon had to question every relationship that he was in. Are they with me because of my power, my wealth, my prestige? Do they even care about me? But Solomon, again, is writing to give us wisdom, and he's going to say, you need community in your life. And so he's going to say, choose well, but here is the benefits for healthy community in your life. He's going to give us three in a passage that we're all familiar with pretty much starting in verse 9. And the first thing he's going to say is, man, when you find the right kind of friends, you're going to find one of the benefits is helping. I don't even know another way to say it, but helping each other. Look at what he says in verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Life was never meant to do it alone. We were created for community. So Solomon said, man, you need people around you who are going to be there with you. So let me ask you, who do you have in your life that you can call when you need help? Who's that person who walks in when everybody else is walking out? Who shows up on moving day, not because they have a truck, but because they really love you and because they're really your friend? In my first church, uh, I was part-time and was one of these trying to have a deal with God. Let me go and be in the business world, I'll, you know, do this part-time thing on the weekend. But we, we made some really deep friends at that time. We, uh, we had, you know, our first child in that church, the pastor and his wife are just incredible friends. And, and I, and Gina and I, during that time, we went and bought some land and it happened to have a house on it, okay? And so we did Fixer Upper before Fixer Upper was cool. I mean, if we'd have thought about a TV show back then, we might be independently wealthy today, but we didn't. And so what we would do is every single free moment, we were at the house and we were doing stuff to fix it. About six months into it, uh, we're getting you know close and I knew, okay, it's time to get the new roof on. So somebody had asked me to do something, can't remember what it was or whatever. I said, no, next week I'm going to start putting the roof on the house. Well, I got a phone call that week, and they said, look, here's the deal. Just tell Gina to have some breakfast ready, uh, and me and some guys are coming over. Man, about 7.30 that morning, truck after truck with, with uh, you know, a, a big trailer on the back starts pulling in the, in the yard. Next thing I know, man, there's noise on the roof. And they're already up on the roof, scraping off the, the, the tiles that were going to have to come off. We, uh, we got them down long enough to have some biscuits and white gravy. Can I give an amen? Can I get an amen? Right? And some good chicory coffee in Louisiana. And, and then everybody hopped up on the roof. And by noon, we were sitting under a shade tree eating jambalaya with a new roof on the house. And let me, just, let me just say this. If I had done it alone... It would have been weeks worth of labor. But because of friends, two are better than one. Who's, who are the people showing up at your house at seven in the morning? Solomon goes on to say, it's going to bring comfort to your life. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. Everybody's going to fall. Not every day is going to be great. We're going, th everybody's going to go through hard times. Who's going to make the phone call? Who's going to show up at your house? When you're going through a storm, who's there to walk through it with you? Thursday, I got a text from a, a dear friend 
said, uh, went to the doctor, they're sending me to the cardiologist, um, no, went to the cardiologist, sending me tomorrow to have an angio. And uh, I just want you guys to know, because you're the, you're the closest friends I have. And uh, I haven't lived in the same town with this guy for 20 years, and still today, I could call him, he would drop everything and come. He sent it to three people. And he said, just, just want to know, you guys are the ones I want to pray in. Friday went in, got another text, hey, going to have to have triple bypass on Monday. Um, I, Friday was an incredibly busy day for me. Right after I got the text, I called him. And we had a great conversation, prayed together. And, and first of all, I was honored that I would be in that text, but it really continued to drive home what God has been teaching me through this passage. Who's that person that's going to be there and make the phone call? And then lastly, protecting. The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strings is not quickly broken. Let me define the protecting that, that I see here. Everybody in this room, you have blind spots. There are areas in your character and your personality and your habits that can be incredibly destructive and you don't see them. That's why we call them blind spots. And so you need people into your life that you have invited into your life to speak truth into your life that you're going to listen to their advice so you don't destroy yourselves. But let me say this. Everybody's going to be willing to give you their opinion. Everybody is going to be quick to point out what's wrong in your life. And that's why Jesus said, hey, here's the deal. Get rid of the plank in your own, own eye before you worry about the speck in somebody else's eye. Because everybody's ready to tell everybody else. And by the way, it's usually in your own fault that you see in others. And you're quick to tell. But these need to be people that you've invited and you're going to listen to what they have to say. So the question is, where do you find them? And with all of this, if we know that we need friends like that, then why are there so few people who have those kind of relationships in their lives? Well, obviously, it's because of envy, insecurity, laziness, and isolation, maybe in us or in the people we've surrounded ourselves with. And we need to ask God to give us faith and wisdom to find those to let into our lives that we can be true friends with. So where do you look? Well, if you're a Christian, you look for other Christians. You look in a faith community. And the best place to find them is not in a worship service, but in a small group. So Troy's going to come and close our time together. You know, we just celebrated our 50-year anniversary, and it was great. I mean, we had a tremendous celebration of all the things this church has done. But it was also a time to do some evaluation. And so we started looking at our, our numbers and the trends and the things that we're seeing. And as you saw from that the monstrosity we had here with all of our numbers and how we've been growing, you know, the church has reached, reached 2,000. We're in services last weekend. But our small group numbers over a year ago are getting smaller. And why is that? Well, about a month and a half ago, I did a sermon and looked at a lot of the trends going on in our society and how things like social media and everything have sort of created these false relationships. But people, though, are just feeling more and more alone and they're not connecting. And so we were look, looking at the way we do small groups. And the way we used to do small groups was this. Hey, it was Sunday morning. The groups are over here in this building. Come and join them. Hope it works for your schedule. Well, these days... People's schedules are very different, and they don't always have that time in order to fit in. It works for some, but not everyone. So that's why we're, we're starting to look at different ways of doing small groups. And so even though we've gone to home groups, which has been awesome, we're finding that uh, there's maybe another step that we could push small groups. As Chuck says, we've got to be more intentional about developing those relationships. And for too long, the church has said, we'll find the leaders. You come and join the leaders in wherever they're meeting. But now we're saying you know what? Anybody can lead a small group. Just with a little training and preparation, anybody can lead, the, lead a small group wherever they are. And so for some of you, it may be, hey, we could do this at work, or we could do this at home, we could do this in a neighborhood, 
or maybe centered around something that you have an interest in. Think of all the different interests you have. What if all these guys who were served in the military got together and said, hey, let's have a small group. It'd be very different than any other small group we have. Some of the things they talk about would be different, but it'd be unique for them, and they would want to do that because of their interest. Some of you like to work out. I got a, one guy right here who works out with me at Planet Fitness, right? Maybe you could center around um, working out or knitting. How about right over here, knitting? You know what? Get a bunch of people together and knit together and talk about God's Word. You can make a small group work based on your interest, your location, and your schedule. And to begin to develop those kind of godly relationships that we see from Ecclesiastes that we need to have in our lives. So if you look inside of your bolt and you'll see that we have small group training coming up in December two times, uh, one of them at Lakeside and one of them here. Both of them teach the same exact material. And we would like to roll out a number of new and different groups that um, would work for you. And maybe when we roll out the schedule, maybe some others would say, hey, we'd like to join it. But it'll be up to you to find those people to populate your group, friends and neighbors who you care about, who you want to reach out to, and begin to develop the kind of godly relationships that uh, God wants for us. Let me pray for that, and then I'm going to dismiss us. Fathers, we heard this sermon series. There are so many people out there alone. And you know what? It, it could be us. Uh, but we know also that the people we're around, you know, we may see them at work. We may see them in the neighborhood. But deep down, there's this fear of being alone. There's this knowledge that maybe there's not enough people around that know what's going on in my life. And so, Lord, we know that small groups are a great way for people to develop those connections. Use your Holy Spirit right now to speak to people, to let them know where it is that they can begin to develop those kind of groups to reach people for your kingdom. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you go, one last thing. Light up Windermere this Friday, 5 o'clock. Our choir is going to be there. There's going to be tons of snow. Wear your B-shirt and come join us. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.